I'll be honest, I don't even know what to say on this one. This is so potentially stupid that I'm not sure what can get worse, although I'm sure he's going to give it a try. This is a perfect example of what the religious do wrong, because here Daniel King does absolutely everything wrong. Get out your love me jackets, because after this, you just might need it. So, here comes Daniel King, proving what a complete nincompoop he is once again. Maybe even worse this time, because, um, yeah, wow. Just wow. As I've said all along, this is going to be a two-parter, because it's just too long to handle in one. And the first part is, shall we say, interesting. As in, you just can't stop watching the stupidity kind of thing. But hopefully trouncing him is at least fun, because it's really not that hard to do. Here we go again with the first part of Proof for God number 9. Sometimes you'd think he's just got to get better than this, but I don't think he ever will. The existence of the Earth is proof God is real. The Earth is amazingly fitted to sustain human life. No, actually, it isn't. This is why these people are such complete idiots. They don't actually know nothing. So let's let Daniel get in his strut, and we'll be back in a minute to watch him make a complete fool of himself. Again, I think that's what we all expect, after all. There is a narrow range of values and a variety of different categories that permit life to exist on planet Earth. And here's where he's going to start going wrong. The only life that he's considering is our life. He's kind of fixated on human beings being special, which is why he and the vast majority of theists completely fail. They don't actually understand the words that are coming out of their own mouths. At least, they've never rationally thought about it. It's why, no surprise, they're not bringing this kind of absurd nonsense to skeptics, because we just laugh our asses off. But while we're at it, let's go look at Daniel's video, and this one, surprisingly, actually has a couple of views. In 10 months, he's managed to rack up 75 views. How many likes? Three. How many dislikes? Again, three. The overwhelming majority of responses are from atheists who are just laughing at this dipshit, and every single response he has is just making empty claims because it strokes his pathetic ego. But sure, let's get going so we can completely wipe the walls with his idiocy. Because won't that be fun? The probability that these perfect conditions appeared by chance is astronomical. For that reason, the finely tuned nature and situation of the Earth is evidence of design. Sadly, Daniel doesn't know what evidence is either. Most theists don't, so I'm going to help him out once again, even though we all know he won't care. Evidence isn't, well, it sounds good to me. Evidence is that which points directly to a demonstrable correlation between the cause and the effect. What he's really doing here, what most of them do, is say, Well, I don't get it, therefore God. But that's not evidence, that's rationalization. That's getting to the conclusion that you wanted to reach all along for completely emotional reasons. If he had any evidence, he'd be able to point to direct demonstrable observations, and how he knows that a certain specific thing, in this case a god, caused those observations to manifest. But I want it to be true! Yeah, that doesn't mean anything, but of course, that's all he's got. Premise A. The fine-tuning of the earth for the existence of all life is due to either chance, necessity, or design. Now, demonstrate that. That's three options that you've thrown out there. Now, prove it's one of those three. And because you can't think of another answer, 
that doesn't mean that there aren't other answers. This is just a false trichotomy. What he's doing here is making bald assertions when he has absolutely no evidence to back any of it up. For one, he hasn't shown that there is any actual fine-tuning at all. He's interpreting it that way because his beliefs demand that it must be that way. But that's not a good reason to think that it's actually that way. This is what happens when you start with your conclusion first and then work backwards. It makes you look like an idiot. Premise B. The fine-tuning of the Earth is not due to chance or necessity. And how did you come to that conclusion? I mean, other than your childish fee-fees. You don't get to just declare shit is true without demonstrating that it is. It's like saying the origin of the universe is either God, Allah, or nature. And it's not God or Allah. Great! What did you just do? Nothing of any consequence. You have to actually prove this stuff, not just bum-rush past it in your desperate race to get to the finish line that you want to reach. That's not how this works. Anybody with the mental capacity of a brain-damaged chimp ought to be able to figure this out, but uh, Daniel, he's not quite at that level, is he? What a dumbass. Premise C, therefore, the fine-tuning of the Earth is due to design. Again, says who? You haven't demonstrated design at all. You've just asserted that it's there, and you haven't shown how it requires design, except in your own tiny little head. It shouldn't surprise anyone that his own comment section is just making fun of him because he's a real imbecile. But wait, he's not done yet. Let's watch him go for the coup de gras. Premise D. If there is design, there must be a designer. Conclusion? Therefore, a designer exists, and this designer is God. Which asshole did you pull that one out of? This is just ludicrous. In fact, it's so ludicrous that I have no idea what he's going to say for the rest of this video or into the next video since this is one of his longer ones and that's why it's going to take two videos to cover. At least, if he doesn't start being overly absurd and I just have to fast forward through the endless Bible verses I just don't know yet, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's what this ended up being, so... uh Forget I said anything. If this ends up being one video, there you go, but uh, that is what it is. The Bible doesn't prove God, and his comprehension of logic, reason, and evidence only demonstrates that he hasn't got the slightest clue. He just wants to believe, but wanting to believe means absolutely nothing. I want to believe that Daniel King has an IQ above room temperature, but uh, sadly, I'm just wrong. Scientists have discovered more than 75 different finely tuned details in our world that are each essential for life to exist. No, they haven't. They have found many different elements that our specific form of life requires. But nobody says that our specific form of life is the only kind of life that can exist. In fact, we've come up with a lot of theoretical life forms that could exist on other chemical components. You could get aliens based on silicon, although that would be difficult because it only forms stable bonds with a few other common elements. They couldn't exist on Earth, of course, because water breaks down silicon bonds, but they could certainly exist on a methane world similar to Venus. You could also have life forms based on ammonia, which is very, very, very common throughout the universe. In fact, there's a lot of star systems out there that we're seeing right now where ammonia is far more common than oxygen. Ammonia can dissolve organic compounds, but unlike water, it can also dissolve some metallic compounds, making a far more diverse chemistry possible. Now, ammonia-based aliens would certainly not exist on an Earth-like world because ammonia is flammable and, uh, in the presence of oxygen, it can easily go up with an ignition source. It has a lower surface tension than water, making it more difficult to hold prebiotic molecules together, and, of course, its melting and boiling port are much lower than water, restricting such life to very cold temperature planets. 
they could also be based on things like the halogen elements. That's fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. It's entirely possible to have an ecosystem where plants absorb carbon tetrachloride, the likely analog of carbon dioxide, convert it by photosynthesis into some kind of carbon chlorine substance, which is analogous to starch, and then give off pure chlorine, just as earth plants give off pure oxygen. In fact, according to a lot of biochemists, it's far easier and far more efficient to reduce carbon tetrachloride than it is to reduce carbon dioxide. It's a more efficient system to work that way. You could also have organic molecules with different chirality. All amino acids, for instance, are left-handed on Earth, while DNA and RNA are right-handed. But that doesn't have to be the case. There is nothing that says that alien forms of life, however they form, would have to follow that convention. It also means they have no interest in Earth, even if they could survive here, because nothing produced here could be processed by their systems. And that is, of course, if you're not talking about, say, cyanobacteria, which doesn't actually depend on chirality to survive. An alien right-handed cyanobacteria could survive here just fine, and because Earth-based predators couldn't eat it, it could catastrophically destroy the food chain and drive the planet into extinction. There is no reason at all to think that this can't exist out there. I'm sure Daniel doesn't know any of this. He doesn't seem to know much of anything, and he doesn't seem to care either. It doesn't stroke his childish ego, which is what all of this is really about. But Daniel's just a dumb shit. If even one of these conditions were slightly out of tune, then life on this planet would be rendered impossible. Nope. Sorry. It would be rendered different. Now, yes, it could render life impossible, but Daniel's only talking about life as we know it, and he has a very poor imagination, except when it comes to his imaginary friend. He has absolutely no knowledge of actual science, which is why he is what he is. He's so attached to the world that he knows that he's incapable of considering any other options, even though other options do exist. So his entire argument fails because Daniel is ignorant and delusional. And that's kind of sad, right? Mathematicians have calculated the probability of all 75 of these details happening perfectly by chance is less than 1 in 100,000 trillion, 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 trillion. That's because you're assuming that this was all planned, that there was some kind of a grand design. And it's too bad you're just wrong. See, we're all a product of our conditions. We evolved to fit the conditions that happened on this planet, and whether he likes it or not, those conditions have changed over time. There have been things that have evolved on this planet that could never ever live today. And, of course, we could never ever have lived in the distant past. Why? Because they evolved to fit different conditions and things that just aren't that way anymore, just as we evolved to fit conditions that didn't used to exist. I bet he didn't know that either, or he chooses to pretend that it isn't true, because it doesn't fit his ignorant worldview. He doesn't want it to be true, because it makes him unhappy. Well, too bad. Here are some of those conditions that make life possible. One, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. You do know that that distance changes rather dramatically every single year, right? Depending on the time of year, the orbit varies by about 5 million kilometers. We just happen to fall within the Goldilocks zone of our Sun, but we're not alone. Venus and Mars, they both fall within that zone where liquid water could exist, and at one point in time, we know that Mars did have liquid water on the surface. It just didn't have the proper size and gravity to maintain a stable atmosphere, so it all just kind of off into space. We also know that there are many other stars out there with Earth-sized planets in their Goldilocks zones that could have life. We found Kepler-186f not that long ago, and it is a perfect candidate. Only 493 light years away, too. This planet is set at precisely the right distance from the sun. 
if the earth was a million miles closer to the sun, we would all burn up. And if the earth was a million miles further away from the sun, we would all freeze. Um, dumbass, our orbit varies by more than a million miles every single year. You are a complete dipshit, Daniel, or weren't you aware of that? Of course, he's ignorant and disinterested in actual reality, because if he did care, a simple Google search would have dissuaded him from saying anything as positively stupid as that. Because Daniel King is a moron. 2. The composition of the atmosphere, oxygen. The atmosphere is 21% oxygen. If oxygen was 25% of the atmosphere, fires would spontaneously combust. Except that's not true, because we know that about 350 million years ago, the Earth had as much as 35% oxygen content in the atmosphere, and it wasn't a raging fire for 50 million years. Besides, things just don't randomly burst into flames because there's oxygen. That's just stupid. It requires fuel, oxygen, and an ignition source. How can anybody as old and hopefully as educated as I hope Daniel is, I mean, he had to go to high school sometime, right? Not no basic high school level science. If it was 15% of the atmosphere, then we would not be able to breathe. That's also false. Because if you go to Alma, Colorado, which is about 9,000 feet up, their effective oxygen content is 15%. And they're doing just fine. Now, if you go to the top of, say, Mount Everest, where the oxygen content is about 7%, people can still survive, but they have to get used to it. Native Sherpas can survive without an oxygen supply, although they really can't physically exert themselves that much. Now, those are some of the extremes, but there are places at sea level that purposely set their internal oxygen levels at 15% for fire protection reasons, and people can work in there just fine. It's called hypooxic air technology. Look it up! Three, the composition of the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. If there was more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect would quickly overrun humans and there would not be enough oxygen to breathe. We already proved that wrong. There's actually a pretty comprehensive study that I'll link to below that blows this one completely out of the water. Currently, there's about 412 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. At current rates, that level will reach 500 parts per million in about 50 years if nothing changes. However, in order for it to adversely affect humans directly, it has to reach much, much, much higher levels. You can lose consciousness at concentrations as low as 110,000 parts per million, but most people require the exposure at about 300,000 parts per million to lose consciousness within about a minute. They've actually done studies at 40,000 parts per million that didn't negatively affect humans or animals, and on submarines, rates are sometimes in that range and people don't just drop dead. You don't start to see problems until you reach maybe 50 to 67,000 parts per million, which is about 19.2% oxygen level, which uh, causes a little bit of decreased hand-arm steadiness, but nothing else. Cognitive function is still just fine, and among fighter pilots, exposure to 50,000 parts per million has been shown to degrade performance a little bit, but it doesn't cause them to drop dead. King hasn't got the slightest clue what the hell he's talking about. And really, who's surprised at this point? If there was less carbon dioxide, plants would not be able to handle photosynthesis. Still wrong. Studies have shown that plants can still photosynthesize at rates of 50 to 100 parts per million. That's less than an eighth of what exists on the surface of the planet right now. Why anybody listens to this dipshit is entirely beyond me. All right, nobody watches his videos, so nobody does. Four, gravity. The gravitational force acting on the Earth is so finely tuned 
that if it was changed by one part in 10, followed by 40 zeros, the sun would run out of fuel and be unable to sustain life, and the moon would either crash into the earth or escape into space. Then it's a good thing that gravity is controlled by mass, right? I mean, he's still wrong, but he's getting into the realm where reality isn't even reality anymore. It's like saying, what if chemistry didn't work anymore? Well, it does, so what's your point? What if the strong and weak nuclear forces vanished? Yeah, then there wouldn't be anybody here to have a discussion about it with, would there? Instead of ripping the rest of this apart, we're just going to fast forward a bit until we can find something else worth discussing, because... I've already conclusively shown that he doesn't know what he's doing, so, uh, chipmunk away. Five, the trickle force of our solar system. the trickle force of solar system, not exactly matched. The gravitational pull of the sun, no planets will be able to maintain orbits. Six, the place of the solar system in our galaxy. If our solar system was part of a million galaxies, solid planets would not be able to form. If we were closer to the center of the galaxy, stellar density would make our orbit impossible. Seven, the situation is the size of a planet Jupiter. The planet Jupiter is in the perfect orbit to act as a gravitational field that protects Earth from asteroids and comets. Eight, the size of the moon is the distance of Earth. If the moon was larger or closer to Earth, tides would be much stronger, and the wash of the coastline. If the moon was smaller or farther away, the planets along the coastline would be unable to survive the lack of nutrient movement. Nine, the surface gravity of the Earth. If the surface gravity of the Earth was stronger, too much ammonia and methane would be retained. If the surface gravity was weaker, the atmosphere would lose too much water and soon be unable to sustain life. Ten, the thickness of the Earth's crust. If the crust was thicker, it would absorb too much oxygen and life be supported. If the crust was thinner, there would be so much volcanic activity and movement of this tiny place that life would be very impossible. Eleven, the precise tilt of the Earth's axis. He's still at it. I mean, this might be the rest of the video. I don't know. Let me go take a look. Uh, uh. All right, it looks like he stops around number 15, but I'll just cover this and we're going to stop for the day because fact-checking an idiot with no facts isn't a lot of fun. We've already firmly established that he's completely clueless. The problem with all of this is that he's never established that it would matter except with our particular form of life. If you got to the point where mass didn't exist, then there wouldn't be a universe. But as I said, he's still playing his little we're so important that it has to be this way game. But nothing says that we're important except in his childish little mind. So we'll do this one just to end in a good place, and then we'll come back next time, wipe out his last couple of objections, and hopefully get onto something that he isn't getting off a creationist website, because they don't know what they're doing either. I just went down to see if he credited his source, and of course he didn't, uh, and that doesn't really matter, but let's just wrap this up. The tilt of the axis of the Earth is perfect for maintaining Earth's temperature and gives us the seasons of the year. If the Earth was tilted a few degrees more in either direction, life on Earth would become impossible. Not remotely true. Life as we know it might not be possible. I mean, it might be, it wouldn't be easy, and people, for example, would have a very limited range right at the equator, but that doesn't mean that life of any kind couldn't exist. You know, axial tilt is the reason for the season and all that. Of course, we don't have to talk about humans. What about tardigrades? We know that they can survive just about anything you throw at them. Pretty much anything but complete planetary destruction and they'll be just fine. I mean, somebody actually looked at what it would take to wipe them out completely and they came up with three possibilities. First, a nearby star goes supernova and completely burns the Earth to a cinder. Secondly, and this is the one I thought of immediately, a gamma ray burst. Third, an asteroid comes by and just blows the planet to smithereens. That's it. That's what it would take. And in reality, though, since tardigrades don't require oxygen, they might even survive the first two, although in vastly diminished numbers. We know that they can survive in space for short periods of time and endure hard radiation. To really kill them, you'd have to entirely wipe out the oceans, and that would take an incredible amount of energy. How much energy? Uh, about 560 septillion joules, which is more than a million years worth of the total energy production of humanity at current rates. So I think they're pretty safe. So this is where we're going to stop this time, and I know why this is so ridiculously long. He found a list on a Christian website somewhere, and he's just reading it to his followers. 
And that's fine, I guess, except that everything he's saying is demonstrably wrong. It's just the dumb leading the dumb, and that describes the vast majority of religion, doesn't it? This is just embarrassing, but I doubt that Daniel cares, because Daniel isn't looking for the truth. He doesn't care about the facts. He just wants to make money off of dumb people. You know, dumb people like himself. If he wasn't an ignorant idiot, there's no way he could just throw this stuff up on his channel unresearched. He'd have done some kind of independent investigation, and I might have to give him a little bit of respect when he didn't do this, but uh, not a lot because he hasn't earned it, but in this case, he's just making himself a laughingstock. The problem is, all theists are doing the exact same thing. They just want to believe. They don't actually care if what they believe makes any sense. So anyhow, we'll come back next time to see the last half of the video, and uh, once we get past all the absurd ignorance, the last couple in his list, hopefully he'll have something better to say. It won't be smart, I don't think he's capable of that, but maybe it'll be a little bit more entertaining. Let's keep our fingers crossed. It's kind of hard to be any dumber than this. Why do the religious have absolutely no clue what they're doing? A right, it's because they don't care, but that's not exactly a good excuse, is it? It shouldn't be difficult to prove just how wrong they are, but they don't know how to do any independent research. They just blather their religious nonsense everywhere and hope nobody notices. Except we do. We always do. So, let's get back to the grind. Welcome back to part two of video number nine of Daniel King's Proof for God series. We're not going to see any more proof here than we have anywhere else, but uh, we're not really surprised at that, are we? At least we don't have to put up with another strut this time, although that means we don't get to laugh at the new music either. I almost wanted to stick one in just for giggles, but uh, I held myself back. Anyway, can Daniel pull it out in the end, or is this going to be even worse than the last time? Place your bets, and let's get going. 12. The Rotation of the Earth So, we're going to start off exactly where we left off, with just four more of these so-called reasons to go. Therefore, I'm just going to go through them real quick, because, hey, we don't have to skip this early in a video, do we? They're not going to fare any better than the rest, and then... I hope he gets on to something more interesting. I mean, honestly, how wrong can one person be all at the same time? I don't know. Let's see. If it took more than 24 hours for the Earth to rotate, it would cause huge, huge temperature swings between day and night. So what? Because, again, people do live in Alaska. Anyone living near the poles has a huge day-night cycle swing, and with them, huge temperature swings. Yet, they're still alive, aren't they? I mean, I know this is a comic book slash movie example, but let's go look at 30 Days of Night. It takes place in Barrow, Alaska, which is a real place, or it was before they changed the name, and it gets dark for an entire month straight. Granted, there are any vampires, at least not that we know of, but there are plenty of places on the planet that get dark for extended periods of time, and people do just fine. People live in sub-zero temperatures. Is he really this stupid, or what? If the rotation of the Earth was accelerated, it would cause substantial atmospheric wind velocity. It would cause the quality of the wind to change, but that's about it. The Earth's rotation causes the Coriolis effect, which causes winds to circulate somewhat chaotically. If the Earth didn't rotate at all, we'd have prevailing winds that are primarily north to south or south to north, generally toward the equator. Again, people live in places with very high winds, myself included, and we're all doing just fine. What a maroon. 13 the planetary ecosystem. The rain falls, waters the plants, runs down rivers to the ocean, evaporates, and falls again. Generally speaking, sure. Now, place your bets on what he's going to get wrong, because we all know that he will. Fractally wrong doesn't even begin to describe the mind of Daniel King. So, go ahead and pause here, 
and let me know where he's going to screw up in the comments. Then we can continue. This water cycle is just one of many cycles, including the nitrogen cycle, oxygen cycle, and carbon cycles. There are cycles of summer and winter and cycles of birth and death. The consistency of these cycles is necessary to make life on this earth possible. Okay, but you haven't shown that you have any understanding whatsoever of any of it, nor that you comprehend what might happen if it was any different. Again, he's just playing make-believe by only considering our current form of life and saying, well, if we can't exist, then nothing could. Because, as I said last time, tardigrades will do just fine with most changes, unless you completely destroy the planet or burn off the seas. So, life is okay, maybe not our life, but we're just not that special. This is just childish ego speaking, which I think pretty much describes Daniel King. 14. Proton Decay If a proton decayed any faster, humans would die from radiation. If protons decayed any slower, there would not be enough matter in the universe for life to exist. Notice how he's struggling to get through some very basic words. Danny boy is just not that bright. He's really at the point of saying, well, what if up was down and down was up? Yeah, he probably believes Australians are standing on their heads. This is really the problem that I have with these religious idiot apologists. They don't actually understand any of it. They're just saying it because it makes them feel good. I'm sure someone could go figure out where he got his list, somebody with more free time than I have, but it doesn't really matter. He can't speak intelligently about any of this because he's not intelligent. This is all just, well, it seems to me crap. And he's demonstrably wrong about all of it. He doesn't care because this isn't about presenting a cumulative intellectual case. It's about throwing around ideas fast and loose so that the religious feel better about the insane things they believe. Again, this video might have 78 views at the time I'm writing this one, but it only has three upvotes. And that tells us that the religious are hardly watching at all. 15. The polarity of water molecules. If a water molecule had any greater polarity, life could not exist. Again, our life. Not any life, just ours, and that's even iffy. I'll let him get on with his insanity in a second, but here's generally what I think he's talking about, even though I'm pretty sure he hasn't got a clue. Water is electrically neutral overall, but because of the arrangement of the hydrogen atoms on the oxygen atom, it's slightly electrically positive on one side and slightly electrically negative on the other. Overall, it all comes out in the wash, but where it's important is hydrogen bonding. It's due to the way that the atoms share electrons that allow water to do some of the things that it does, and we all know that Daniel doesn't understand any of this. He's just reading off of a script that he found online. So let's give him a second to hang himself further before we continue. If a water molecule had less polarity, ice would not float, and it would continue to build up until the whole planet was frozen over. Um, no. I mean, given temperatures above the melting point, ice would still melt just fine. Going back to the last videos, we are still in the Goldilocks zone, meaning that liquid water will still be maintained. If we were further out in the solar system, sure, maybe, unless something like nuclear decay or internal stresses caused the temperature to rise, and that's why there's likely liquid water beneath the surface of Europa. Tidal forces from Jupiter do all of that, and our own moon would help at least a little bit. Would we have some environmental effect? Sure. Would it turn the planet into an ice ball? No. No, it wouldn't. We might have a really bad ice age, but guess who lived through the last ice age? Yeah, humans did. And that is just 15 of 75 necessary conditions for life to exist. And you screwed up all 15. If he just taken a moment, just one, 
to type any of these things into Google, he would have found out just how wrong he was. But he didn't bother with that, did he? Because he doesn't care, and he doesn't figure his intended audience cares either. They'll all just go, uh-huh, 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 because they aren't concerned about the reality of any of it. I mean, we could go back and debunk the claims that we skipped over last time. I only did it because I didn't want to bore anybody, but really, what's the point? It isn't like King has a brain in his head. He just doesn't give a crap. He's just embarrassing himself in public, and I find it hard to believe that anybody doesn't recognize that, except for the terminally religiously dumb. How did such precision come about? It didn't. Now, let's revisit the puddle analogy, because it's really all that needs to be said. I mean, there's no other conclusion you can come to. And it's rather like a puddle waking up one morning. I know they don't normally do this, but allow me, I'm a science fiction writer. <laughs> a puddle wakes up one morning and thinks, this is a very interesting world I find myself in. It fits me very neatly. In fact, it fits me so neatly I mean, really precise, isn't it? <laughs> it must have been made to have me in it. And the sun rises, and he's continuing to narrate the story about this hole being made to have him in it. And the sun rises, and gradually the puddle is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And by the time the puddle ceases to exist, it's still thinking, it's still trapped in this idea that the, the whole was there for it. And if we think the world is here for us, we will continue to destroy it in the way that we've been destroying it, because we think we can do no harm. There are only two possible explanations, random chance or intentional design. Bullshit. Welcome back, false dichotomy. We've missed you. The mathematical probability of everything happening by chance are so astronomically small as to approach impossibility. Not remotely. The problem here is that he's starting out with the assumption that our current state is what was supposed to happen. And then he's calculating odds based on how hard it would be to make it happen exactly as it did. But that's not how reality works. It's why I did the puddle video again because, well, I love Douglas Adams, and this is exactly what he's doing wrong. We are a product of our universe. Our universe does not exist specifically to bring us about. The chances of things turning out exactly as they did, they're 100%, because there they are. We are the way that we are because that's how the universe is. We are not special. Get over yourself. So great is the improbability that it takes more faith to believe in random chance than it does to believe in an intelligent creator. No, we just have to point out how piss poor your assumptions are. This is exactly why you don't rely on worldviews. That's where he's going fundamentally wrong. He assumes, without evidence or reason, that the crap in the Bible is true. Why? Because he wants the crap in the Bible to be true. No questions, no evidence, it's all true, because that's what he wants. Because that's what makes him feel good. He's not looking at the reality that he's a part of, only the fantasy world that he wishes was real. It's why, if you go back and you watch his Worldviews videos, he spends a whole lot of time saying, from the Christian worldview. But the Christian worldview is fundamentally flawed. Your emotional state doesn't mean anything. You just want to believe. And this is why you don't start off with a conclusion before you even evaluate the evidence. Because then, you wind up looking like an imbecile. You know just like Daniel King. Atheists respond to the evidence of the finely tuned universe by pointing to the anthropic principle. This principle proposes that the appearance of fine tuning is only an idea that humans have who can observe their universe. 
because it's true. That is the whole point of the puddle example, which I have to keep going back to, sorry. You only think that way because it makes you happy. You want to feel special. Therefore, you invent an interpretation of reality that makes you feel special. But what you want doesn't matter. How you feel is irrelevant. Now, I've had this discussion a lot, but here it goes again. How many Christians have come up to you and asked if you want to go to hell? And my response is always, who cares? Because what I want doesn't matter. If there was a rogue black hole headed for Earth, my feelings about it wouldn't change a thing, would they? It's either coming or it's not. My emotional state is completely irrelevant. So if there is a hell, I'm going, and that's that, because I'm not changing my mind until I am intellectually convinced that there's a God that's real and uh, worth bowing down to. And I am not currently convinced, and based on what I'm seeing from the religious, that's not going to happen anytime soon. The consequences of that are completely irrelevant. Prove to me that it's true, or just leave me alone. So if no humans existed to observe the fine-tuning, the fine-tuning would effectively not exist. Therefore, life exists in the universe, not because of design, but because the universe had the capacity to eventually support life in one of its solar systems. Maybe more. We just don't know. Effectively, though, that's it. If the universe had been different enough to not support our form of life, our form of life wouldn't have evolved. Maybe another form would have, and they'd likely be arguing just how perfect the universe is to fit them exactly. And if no life had formed, then nobody would be around making these silly claims. That's just the way it goes. How you feel about it doesn't matter. This is what reality shows us is true. Grow the hell up. Richard Dawkins, the atheist, referred to this principle when he wrote, However improbable the origin of life might be, we know it happened without God's help on earth because we are here. And he was right. You have no evidence for any gods, and uh, here we are. Nice, huh? Douglas Adams, the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, mocks the argument from design when he tells the story of a puddle of water that wakes up one day and is pleased to find that his hole is perfectly designed to fit him. So, he knows all about it, but he still doesn't understand. I wouldn't really say if he was unaware, but holy crap, he's dumb. He's even dumber now that he understands the objections and still believes. Let's see what he has to say, though. I'm trying to be somewhat charitable, even though he certainly hasn't earned it. But these responses, rather than dealing with the facts of fine-tuning, Simply avoid them. And where are these facts exactly? Because all I've heard from you, from any apologist, are just empty claims. This is all your say-so, your feelings, and your interpretations based on your own preconceived notions. That is not a fact. Facts require objectivity. Facts require demonstration. They must exist beyond your personal feelings about them. And this is where the religious fail miserably, and Daniel here, he apparently doesn't care. He just wants to believe. And that's utterly stupid. Imagine standing in front of a 10-gun firing squad. The command rings out, ready, set, fire. All 10 guns report, but you're not hit by any bullets. Either you're on a movie set, or they're really, really bad shots. Now, I don't know what his next couple of words are going to be, but uh, let me guess. God did it. Or I could be wrong, but I figure it's got to be something along those lines. You can't explain it, therefore, God or whatever. Any religion can come up with their own comforting explanation for things they don't understand. But that doesn't make the explanation true. This is where they don't comprehend how evidence works. Just because you like a thing... That doesn't make that thing so. You have to show a direct and demonstrable causal link between your proposed explanation and the event in question. Just because you don't understand it, that doesn't mean that God done it. 
But let's see what he really has to say because I'm really kind of getting tired of this blowhard for this video. Undoubtedly, you would be surprised to find yourself still alive. Now, what would happen if the 10 soldiers reloaded and fired again, but the same result comes, that you're still standing and in good health? Take two, because this is just pointless. This is just, well, what if? Who cares about what if? I care about what is. Show me anywhere that this has actually happened and we can investigate the cause. We might not be able to come up with one, depending on when his theoretical example took place, but then the answer is, we don't know. It's not God unless you have evidence that God is real, and God was demonstrably responsible. You got any of that? Yeah, I didn't think so. Then you might start to feel that the odds were on your side. If this happened 10 times over and over again, eventually you're going to start asking yourself why no bullets are hitting you and how it could be possible that you are still alive. Maybe because you're a crap actor and the director is getting pissed. Or maybe it's a joke. Or maybe this is all just a fantasy in his head, which seems more and more likely all the time. This is why I don't do what ifs. Give me something objectively real to evaluate. Then we'll talk. The truth is that the chances of this world accidentally evolving into a perfect home for the human species is so astronomically small that it would be the equivalent of surviving a firing squad of 10,000 rifles, not just once, but over and over again for many years. Yeah, um, your analogies leave a lot to be desired, especially when you so clearly misunderstand the reality behind it all. This is like Daniel standing there with a blindfold on and the director yelling, Cut! How many times are we going to have to do this? Do you have the slightest idea what the hell you're doing? Because obviously he doesn't. We're nine videos into this. Well, ten because I think there was an intro. I could be wrong about that. It's hard to remember back that far. But uh, he still hasn't gotten anywhere remotely close to a clue. He clearly knows what he's doing is wrong, or at least he should, yet he persists. What kind of a moron is he? Let me know your views down in the comments. In the face of such odds, surely we have to start wondering why this world is so perfectly suited for human life. The fine-tuning of all the factors necessary for human life Prove to me that this world has a designer, and I believe that designer is God. You still have to prove it. I mean, your series is called Proofs for God, so, um, yeah, you're nowhere remotely close. What he's really doing is just bald rationalizations for God, and even there, he's still doing a piss-poor job at it. Now, I do have one more video in the queue, but... I wanted to throw out the next couple so people can let me know if they're still interested in seeing these. Video 10 is DNA proves God exists. And I bet it doesn't. I bet he doesn't even know what DNA is. Next comes the human eye, then bacteria, then a screed against evolution, which I figure ought to be a peach. He doesn't get back to any philosophical arguments until number 14 when he goes to the ontological argument, and then comes an argument for morality. Now, I know we're still a ways out, but I just noticed that he published video 17 without ever publishing video 16. At least, I don't see it anywhere in the vicinity, and we all know he's not that bright, so uh, Daniel King is a dipshit once again. There are a couple of these that have decent view counts, I guess, but... Uh, I don't know. I'm hoping some of those will at least be watchable, but I guess we'll have to see. So, how long do you want this to keep going on? Because I'm game as long as people want to watch it. Let me know down in the comments, and uh, we'll just keep Danny Boy around for as long as we can tolerate him. And how long that is, is completely up to you.